Hello, and welcome to ADCES's podcast, The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. In each episode, we speak with guests from across the diabetes care space to bring you perspectives, issues, and updates that elevate your role, inform your practice, and ignite your passion. I'm Kirsten Yale, Research Manager at the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. If you enjoy The Huddle, please take a minute to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Your review helps us reach more members of the diabetes care team and further our vision for optimal health and quality of life for persons with, affected by, or at risk for diabetes and chronic conditions. Today, we're talking about the Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist Credential. Many of you listening might have it or have heard about it, but what is required to earn the credential? How do you study? What do you need to renew? Cheryl Traficano is the CEO of the Certification Board for Diabetes Care and Education and joins us today to answer your questions. Cheryl, welcome to the huddle. Thanks. Very glad to be here today. Well, we are so pleased to have you on the podcast today. And since it's National Diabetes Month, November, I have to ask, are you sporting blue? I absolutely am. And in fact, I'm sporting my shirt that I would have been wearing if we had ADCES in person this year. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm wearing my blue socks. I try to wear something (laughs) blue every day through the whole month of November. So again, we really appreciate you joining us today. And the Certified Board for Diabetes Care and Education, where you are the CEO, is a close partner to the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. And in so many ways, the work we do in each organization complements the other. So I like to think we're really great partners for the diabetes care and education specialty. So with all of that said, before we get started, I think it'd be really great if you could introduce yourself and the work of the certification board. Absolutely. Thank you. And we are great partners, but our organizations are different. My name is Cheryl Traficano. I'm the CEO of the organization, and I've actually been with the organization since May of 2000. So I've seen a lot of uh, positive changes and good things happening both with our certification and in the specialty. So glad to be here again. So the organization CBDCE is different, like from ADCES, we're not a membership organization. We are a national, non-governmental, not-for-profit. We're overseen by a volunteer board of directors, and that board is made up of folks who are CDCESs, and then we also do have a public member who sits on our board. And then we do have various committees and task forces, and those are also made up typically of our volunteer CDCESs and sometimes public members, depending on what the actual task or goal of the committee is. And then our organization is actually responsible for, uh, you know, the certification as a CDCES program, uh, but we're also responsible for maintaining our accreditation. So just like we ask and hope that people who are doing diabetes care and education become certified, we also as an organization want to make sure that we're doing best practices in the certification. So we do have our own Uh, accreditation. The mission of our organization is to promote comprehensive and ongoing quality diabetes clinical management education, prevention, and support by defining, developing, maintaining, and protecting the certification and credentialing processes. Boy, that's a big job in this growing field is what I'll say. And I had to back up for a second and say, I didn't realize that you've been with this organization for almost 20 years. I mean, that longevity speaks to probably the growth of the need of the specialty, would you say? Absolutely. And it's just amazing the commitment and the passion that the diabetes care and education specialist brings to the practice, whether they pursue certification or not. There's such a commitment there to people with diabetes. Couldn't agree with you more. I came here from a research environment and I've been impressed. I've only been in my role for a little over three years, and I'm impressed every day with the members and the people that I work with. But you know, just to transition a little bit here, thinking about the conversation we're having now, is that there are so many studies pointing to the impact of diabetes care and education on quality of life or clinical outcomes. And especially when I'm thinking about in health systems, it comes down to cost. So there's an immense cost-effective impact of diabetes care and education. And coming back to this idea that it's a really big job and with cases rising, you know, the need for more diabetes care and education specialists is really imperative. So we get this question really frequently over at the Association for Diabetes Care and Education Specialists and usually refer them over to you, is how does somebody get certified to be a diabetes care and education specialist? So there's a whole process and it's typical and very much like other certifications in the health field. 
And so people have to, and this is different because our certification is multidisciplinary and it is rare in the health profession. They have uh, certifications that are multidisciplinary, but we have a whole number of different disciplines or licenses and even degrees that can qualify. But people first have to meet that license or registration or degree. They then accrue experience in the field. That's both just in general in their discipline and then also really doing diabetes care and education. So there's two different practice requirements that deal with that. And then we do ask people to get some continuing education prior to sitting for the exam as well. So down to the nitty gritty here, how can somebody achieve certification as a diabetes care and education specialist? Okay, so now I'm going to get specific. (laughs) Let's go by steps. So step one is they need to meet that disciplinary requirement. So again, various license and registrations qualify. So that includes registered nurses, registered dietitian nutritionists, exercise physiologists, physicians, PAs. So first you do that, you meet that requirement. Then the next step is that you're going to look for education or for the experience, because that's really, you know, everybody learns a little bit about diabetes and their different education or ways they move into those license or registrations. But we all know diabetes, you know, there's not a lot of time spent on diabetes. So it's really important that people are working in the field to gain the important knowledge and skills related to that. So after they meet that discipline or license requirement, they're going to look for a work experience. So first, it's two years just in general, and that does not have to be diabetes experience. As long as they're working as their RN or an RDN, that time counts, and that does not have to be full-time. It can be part-time. So it's really a time frame of just general experience. And then the other thing related to that is then they want to accrue 1,000 hours of diabetes education experience. And so they have up to four years to accrue those 1,000 hours. The only thing we do ask, though, is that people have at least 400 hours sometime in the last 12 months. We just think it's really important for people to have current experience close to the time that they're going to be sitting for the examination. We do get a lot of questions about what counts for that diabetes education experience. And we really say, have a conversation with your supervisor. Look over the definition of diabetes education, which we have um, you know, available on the website, in the handbook. So really talk with your supervisor and say, these are the things that I'm doing. This is the definition. How would you like me to track that? Because the thing is, when someone applies for certification, they are going to just attest to the fact that they meet all the requirements. But if you get chosen for audit for the practice, your supervisor is going to have to be able to sign off and attest to whatever hours you're claiming. So have that conversation with your supervisor. They may know that you do it from dawn till dusk, and they may not need any documentation to be able to verify it, but they also might need, say, an Excel file where you keep track of hours. And you kind of want to keep that for yourself as well so you know where you're falling in when you're getting close to being able to apply to sit for the examination. So they become an RN or RD or one of our licenses or registrations. They're working in the field. And at the same time that they're working in the field, they can be accruing, they need 15 hours of continuing education that's applicable to diabetes. And they need that sometime in the last two years before they apply. And they can be doing the working and the CE at the same time. And sometimes that's just naturally going to happen. If you start a position somewhere, a lot of times they're going to support you and want you to take CE and areas related to diabetes. And so once you can document that you've met all those things, then you apply for the examination. So quick question back to step one. We hear this a lot is, Right now, you can be an RN without a bachelor's of science in nursing. Do you need a bachelor's degree? You do not, as long as you hold that RN, however you got that, because the license works. People all take the same exam to become licensed as an RN. So for our program, as long as you hold that RN license, you meet that qualification. And then you mentioned this about tracking your hours. Like, How do you usually receive those, or how do people track their hours and submit them when they're applying for the exam? So they don't actually have to submit anything related to the hours when they apply. So you're just attesting that you've met each of those requirements as part of the application process. But if you get chosen for audit, which is just a random process, it's an algorithm and you might, you know, you might get picked for audit, you might not. So then you're going to document and we actually provide you with the documentation that you need to complete to fill out. So for the practice, they're going to say, we have a form where it's going to be, here's my job, here's the dates. Here's the hours I'm claiming for it. And then they have the supervisor actually sign a form that verifies 
what they've been documenting, you know, as far as their experience goes. Fantastic. And you have all of this on your website, right? The steps one through four? Absolutely. We even have the audit documentation so people could see what it looks like before they even apply. You can see what that looks like. We try to be very transparent with any documentation or requirements. And I think we're going to put this in the episode notes too. So I know people can find it. Um, And that actually reminds me too, I know that, um, you know, when we talked and we've talked several times, you know, in the past couple months that we have study guides here at ADCES that we're going to put the link in the episode notes about where people can find those. And that reminds me to ask you, how do people prepare for the exam? Kirsten, that's a great question. And, you know, it's sort of one of the challenges when people are coming from so many different backgrounds as far as trying to help them. But really, you know, the basis for the studying and, and preparing for the exam is knowing what our exam content outline is and what items are on that. And again, that's on the website and in the current year's handbook. So really take a look at that and kind of assess, you know, go through and you're like, oh, you know, I do this sometimes. I don't do it much, but there's a lot of questions here because we actually even tell you in the different sections, how many questions there's going to be. So do a self-assessment. And then the other thing is think about that you're going to be responsible for knowledge over all of that content outline. And so prioritize the content that you're going to look at based on your strengths and weaknesses. So the big thing we talk about is also consider your population. So if you mostly work with people with type 1, when you look through that content outline, Think about the other, you know, patient populations. So you might need to take some CE or do some talk with some of your fellow diabetes care and education specialists related to, say, gestational or type 2. And again, a dietitian might be really strong in nutrition and maybe wound care might be something that they want to find information out about if that's when they go through the content outline, that's something that they identify. So that's the really big thing regarding the diabetes aspect of it. And then they just want to do all the normal things they would do for studying for sort of any examination. You know, take a look at that, create a timeline, create a study plan with a timeline, check around for other resources like ADCS is a great resource if they need CE, especially in a particular area. There are review courses out there. Just make sure they make sense for what you need to get your knowledge and skills up about. You consider forming a study group. And we do have test taking tips that are on the website and the Canada Handbook. We actually even have a little tips brochure. And just pace yourself. You know, don't don't be cramming. Take your time, especially in the environment now. It's a it's a tough environment for anybody. So just pace yourself and give yourself time to take breaks and those sorts of things. You know, when you say pace yourself as you were talking, I was thinking in my head, you know, with the time I've spent in school, you know, in both undergrad and graduate school. When I look back, I think, why didn't I appreciate that time? You know, why, why didn't I enjoy the process? You know, <laughs> there's always something more to learn. Absolutely. So the one other piece I want to get in here is the renewal process. So once you have the certification, what is the renewal process like? Once someone passes the exam for the first time, then they're certified. And that is a five-year cycle. And so when it's time for renewal, we do have a practice requirement for renewal, but it's greatly expanded over what counts for initial certification because we actually know a lot of people who become certified often move up quite quickly and might move out of direct patient contact and education. So that definition is a little bit different. So as long as you've still been practicing in diabetes under that expanded definition, then you can choose to renew either by continuing education or you can still choose to take the examination. And believe it or not, we do still have people who do that. But the continuing education pathway then is 75 hours of CE applicable to diabetes any time over their cycle. And so that's the two pathways. And then if someone has moved out of diabetes, if say a nurse has moved into the cancer area, that sort of thing, and they really haven't been doing diabetes and can't meet that practice requirement, they can actually still you know, maintain their certification. How they do that is they're basically going to apply for the exam, but they'll document that they've done 75 hours of CE. So that replaces that practice requirement, basically. So no one has to lose their credential if they want to maintain it, even if they moved out of directly working in the diabetes area. We don't want to lose our certified diabetes care and education specialist. Thank you for walking us through this whole process. I mean, honestly, sometimes I think it's a little bit daunting, but the way you walked us through it today, I think really makes it straightforward, easy to understand. I think anyone can do this. And it's almost like with anything, right? Like when we get an idea, we're inspired and we want, you know, you want to do something. And then at the outset, you look at like, oh my gosh, look at everything I have to do. But it's really not that much. Just a little piece that can really advance your career and change 
lives for so many people with diabetes that enjoying the process and the outcome can be pretty incredible. That's a wonderful way of putting it. <laughs> like here, so that really is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's sort of the same thing about studying, right? To actually become certified, just take your time. Don't be in a rush. Like you said, it's really important, especially, I mean, that experience is what's going to help you pass the examination. Really take your time. Be really part of that when you're actually doing it. I think we're just about to wrap up, but if I can ask you this one question I like to ask people at the end of our conversations, if you had a crystal ball, where would you see the Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist credential in 10 years? Well, I really hope that we have many more people who are certified, but I also look forward to seeing it evolve now that we have the new vision for the specialty. We're really interested in seeing how we can advance the specialty and the certification. And then that certification, we want to make sure that it still reflects everything that's happening in the specialty. So having that new vision is really an exciting time for us as far as the certification program goes. Cheryl, thanks so much for coming and having this conversation with us. I know that so many people are going to benefit from you walking us through this process. And I bet you we're going to see a rise in diabetes care and education specialists. Kirsten, we're so appreciative of our partnership with ADCS. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to reach out to more folks. Stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy uh, November and National Diabetes Month. You too, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. Today, we found out what exactly is required to become a Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. Cheryl Traficano is the CEO of the Certification Board for Diabetes Care and Education and shared the four steps to becoming certified. These include meeting the disciplinary requirements, working or volunteering in diabetes care, accruing 15 hours of CE applicable to diabetes in the last two years, and applying for, taking, and passing the exam. Cheryl also shared the importance of studying for the exam and resources you can access to help. You can find this information and more at cbdce.org. ADCES has a review guide and other resources that can help you study for the exam. Learn more at diabeteseducator.org forward slash CDCES. Membership at ADCES gives you access to the education, networking, and resources to improve your practice and optimize outcomes for your clients. Find out what ADCES can do for you at diabeteseducator.org forward slash join. The information on this podcast is for informational purposes only and may not be appropriate or applicable for your individual circumstances. This podcast does not provide medical or professional advice and is not a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.